Well, good evening, brothers and sisters. Greetings from a, a Drich Aberdeen in November. But uh, good to have this opportunity uh, to say something, I hope, helpful to you. I want to speak about Pope Francis. Uh, actually, I want to speak up for Pope Francis uh, and hopefully ease the difficulties that some have with him. Uh, hence this reflection, uh, you could call it, uh, if you gave it a title, well, coping with the Pope, or uh, is the Pope a Catholic? Well, for some in the church, I'm, uh, mainly, I mean, he's just occasionally baffling or disconcerting. But others feel ill at ease, uh, others disturbed, some clench their teeth when his name is mentioned or bite their lips and just keep quiet. Others are vocal and vehement and sail their noisy boats on the blogosphere. That's more or less, I think, the, the range of responses. Well, of course, for many, uh, he's just the Pope and that's kind of it and that's fine. Uh, and for many, he's an inspiration. But still, I'd like to to address those who feel a difficulty here. Now, we're not required to be papal fanatics. We're not forbidden to have reservations about any pope. We're not constrained to share his every priority. And so I'm not out here to push for unbridled enthusiasm. If possible, uh, Maybe I'm setting my sights too high, but if possible, I'd just like to ease a burden that some are carrying or to diminish an unhappiness, because it's not helpful uh, in, in any context to be disaffected, not helpful here for our Christian and Catholic life. Uh, we, we, we can't possibly answer every question or resolve every objection and so on, but there is another way now, I'm, uh, I'm often struck by uh, one part of the second Eucharistic prayer. It's the prayer for the church. And it goes, remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and N, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Uh, together with, we want to grow in charity, together with, una cum in Latin. Uh, in, in theology, we talk of communion, uh, a communion of mind and heart, sentire cum ecclesia, to, to feel, to be in sympathy with the church. Now, there's no, uh, no need to over-egg that, but it's, it's a good frame of mind to be in and to enjoy. It's a translation into our, in, into our own lives, into our Christian subjectivity, if you like, of a great objectivity, of a given. Uh, the, the, the mission, the ministry of Peter and his successors. This exists, it's a, a, a historical fact, it's a fact of faith. It's a mission to profess the faith for the successor of Peter, uh, to be a rock, to be the keeper of the keys, to confirm the brethren, to shepherd the sheep. It's a mission of being a visible head. Uh, the mission of being, uh, one of the phrases that's come down, is the principle and foundation of unity. And I just think it's sad uh, if we have to bracket that off as, as Catholics. Uh, if we just try and sort of carry on, uh, but ignore, ignore the successor of Peter. So, just a word on behalf of him. Well, I'll work into this step by step. But on the road to Damascus, Saul, as he then was, Saul of Tarsus, met the risen Lord and became Paul the Apostle. God revealed his son in me he later wrote. Now that occurred probably around 34, 35 AD, uh, very soon after the Easter events. 
And he then went off, Paul. What did he do after that experience? He says he went off to Arabia, which could mean a lot, and for three years. Then he came back to Damascus. Then, by now we're probably 37, 38 AD, he went up to Jerusalem for a fortnight to visit Cephas, that is, Simon Peter. He went to visit him. Now, the word means that. It means uh, to visit in order to see. Sometimes translated that, he went up to uh, Jerusalem to see Cephas. Uh, to see, to visit, says St. John Chrysostom, as one might visit a famous city, to go and see it. It means to visit, if used of a person, the word in the New Testament, in order to get to know them. Paul went to Jerusalem, we could say, to learn Peter. Now, John Paul II used to say that we have to learn the Pope. We have to adjust uh, to every Pope that comes along, just as parishioners, you know, have to adjust to a parish priest and the diocese has to adjust to a bishop and so on. And uh, so I, I think that's a useful idea, this idea of learning, getting to know, learning a Pope. And that's the way to get to this together with Unakum. Another preliminary just comes to my mind. Uh, blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, Simon son of J J John, and you are dot dot Peter. Now Giuseppe Roncalli became John the twenty third. Giovanni Battista Montini became Paul the sixth. Carol Wojtyła became John Paul II, Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict, Jorge, Jorge, Bergoglio, Francis. So there's a human being there. When we, when we think of a Pope, there's a human being with his personal name, his individuality, a biography. He's there with a family name, Bergoglio in this case. So he's got a family, he's got a nationality, he's got a history. And all that, through, the, through his papal name, is taken up into what has been called the mystery of Peter. It's a mystery which is a mixture, as we know from the Gospels, of weakness and strength, limit and grace. A taking up that is a process that's going to unfold in time, led by the Holy Spirit, be affected by contingent events, is going to be unfinished as, as a man. Just think of an individual being given this extraordinary mission, this extraordinary burden, and living through it. It's an impossible mission, actually. And at least I would have thought a Pope deserves sympathy. Um, uh, I think we could, should be willing to interpret him benevolently. Uh, hopefully, well, we do, as it were, ex officio in the Mass, accompany him with our prayer. It's hardly uh, an easy call. Here's this, you know, limited human being suddenly found um, sitting, on, sitting on the chair of Peter. Now, I think most of us who, who, who you know, <laughs> listen to this, uh, given our background, shouldn't really be surprised if we're taken aback, if we're wrong-footed or left scratching our heads by a Latin American Argentinian Jesuit. We probably don't know very many of them, uh, whose parents, think of it, were Italian immigrants whose family was not without conflicts, who had lived through a dictatorship and a dirty war and all the uh, post-conciliar upheavals that the Society of Jesus uh, went through and the controversies of liberation theology. Uh, someone who has had an extensive pastoral experience of, off, 
of ordinary, poor, often destitute people, and who, uh, at the age of 76, finds himself catapulted onto a world stage where everything he says and does uh, will be scrutinised. Uh, well, we might at least be curious as to what he might bring, what fresh air, perhaps, from Buenos Aires. But I mean, he's, he's coming from a very different stable than most of us come from. Uh, the one faith allows of many perspectives and one of the the joys of the church's universality is the exchange of gifts and enriching exchange of gifts that there can be different parts of the church people from different backgrounds different cultures so forth different personal experiences um, are able to give to in this case the whole church but we are going to find it baffling if we are what we are, North European dot dot dot. Now, people often ask a bishop, have you met the Pope? Well, yes, I have. Uh, not a, precisely one to one, but I met him on the 27th of September 2018. I met him along with the other seven bishops of Scotland and uh, two people who work in the bishop's secretariat. And we were on what is called the ad limina visit to Rome. Every so many years, uh, bishops go to Rome to visit Peter and the departments of the Holy See and to render an account of their ministry. And uh, a meeting with the Pope is part of that. So we met him as a group in one of the, the rooms in the Vatican. Uh, the, uh, we were pretty tense, I would say, when we went in. Uh, there was us, him, and a translator uh, sitting sitting next to him. He understands English if you speak it uh, slowly and clearly, but he's not so happy always speaking in English. Well, we were with him, or he gave us one hour and 40 minutes, which was good of him because on, on the grand scale of things were not very important. Uh, it was informal. Uh, it was a free-flowing conversation. We put questions and, and made comments and he responded and uh, he livened up visibly as the meeting went on. There were serious things to talk about but there was a lot of humour as well and we came out um, happy and relaxed. A complete change. But the real thing that struck me was deeper. Now, I know it's a cliche, but it really was as though during that time we were the only people who mattered. The Pope wasn't looking at his watch. Uh, he wasn't trying to hide yawns. Uh, he was fully there. And consider the circumstances. This was sometime like half past 10, 11 in the morning. Now, before we went in, I noticed the prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith coming out. So he'd already had that meeting and they wouldn't have been talking about the weather, you know. Uh, on the evening of two days before, or about 36 hours before, the Pope had returned from a three-day visit to the Baltic States. And that's the same afternoon that we met him. There was some major celebration he had to lead. I can't remember what it was. And this is an 81-year-old man. But what he conveyed uh, wasn't exhaustion. I think we, we said to him at the beginning, uh, you know, oh, you must be, you know, you must be tired. Uh, he made the interesting remark, uh, well, he said, I'm, I'm only tired when I'm, when I'm by myself. <laughs> when I'm with other people, uh, he feels fine. That's him. But, as I say, he wasn't just going through the motions. What came from him uh, very palpably was peace, which is remarkable, because there were some pretty nasty things 
uh, going on at that at that time and some of them centered on him but he gave off peace and also gave off a total dedication to the church and to the people he was with at a given time so i would like just to flag up first of all uh, that he is a man of god now some of this you'll you'll know but in one of his early interviews as pope he was asked who is uh, forgive my pronunciation who is jorge Ma Mari mario bergoglio well after a pause he famously replied a sinner whom the lord has looked upon now that remark went back in fact 60 years to uh, you'll find it in the biographies to the 21st of september saint matthew's day 1953 when something happened to him in the confessional of a church in buenos aires uh, he was 16. he was actually going to see his um, his girlfriend uh, and some other young mates but he realized in that moment he was called to the priesthood now in the gospel for saint matthew's day jesus saw it says looked on the tax collector a sinner and called him to follow him that's so when he says who am i who is jorge Mar mario Bergoglio? a sinner whom the lord has looked upon he's going back to that experience on st matthew's day in 1953 he's going back to that gospel and later he would become aware of the commentary of saint bede the venerable on that gospel it's in the divine office for saint matthew's day and there saint bede says jesus saw him matthew not so much with his bodily eyes as with the look of inner compassion he saw the tax collector and because he looked at him with mercy and chose him he said follow me now to look at with mercy and to choose in latin it's very elegant miserando et eligendo having mercy and choosing and later uh, Bergoglio, when he became a bishop took that phrase of saint beads as his motto and it's still his motto as pope miserando et eligendo having mercy and choosing now the last strand in this story is uh, the, the, the fine dramatic painting by caravaggio of the call of matthew and the original of that is in the church of saint louis of the french in rome and before he was pope Bergoglio would uh, often go and visit that church privately and spend time looking at that painting so i mention all this because this helps us get to who the guy is the core of how he understands himself a sinner whom the lord has looked upon a sinner aware of being mercied if you could say that in english and chosen by grace pope francis is and, and this certainly came across when we met him first and foremost a spiritual and evangelical man someone who feels looked at and touched by the lord now he then became a jesuit which gave flesh uh, and uh, friendship to this call it gave him the formation of the spiritual exercises of saint ignatius which are a great force can be in people's lives helping people discern the will of god and and follow christ with their whole being and through all his mutations through all the different things he's he's done or undergone uh, jesuit provincial rector of a college then he was kind of parked as we say these days uh, set aside 
then became an auxiliary bishop, then Archbishop of Buenos Aires and all the rest. If throughout all of that, the heart of this man, the core, the source, the centre, is Christ. And, and that sense of being called, of being mercied, and being chosen by Christ. And that's, uh, you know, one must never forget that. Okay. And as for his normal daily routine, uh, he gets up around 4.30 and spends the next two hours praying the office, meditating, reading the scripture of the day before saying mass at 7 a.m. Well, you know, that's not bad in, in, in your early 80s, really, at all. And uh, he once... Uh, during the pontificate of, of John Paul II, it must have been when John Paul II was in, I think it was when he was in uh, Argentina or Brazil or somewhere, and uh, Bergoglio was, was, was sort of near him, behind him, and John Paul II was leading the rosary, and it just very much struck Bergoglio how John Paul was doing it, and from that point on, he, he said, I'm going to say the whole rosary each day. Now, heaven knows if, how, if he does that as Pope, I, I don't know. But he, he, he took it up. Or, and, and, uh, and if he can, he also includes, you know, an hour of adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. I mean, that's remarkable when you think of the workload. So there's a first thing. Pope Francis is a man with a strong personal relationship to Christ. He's a man who has weathered many painful passages in his life uh, physically he's only got one lung uh, emotionally socially but he stuck it stuck it out he's mellowed uh, he has grown he has persevered he has heard the follow me and been faithful so this doesn't necessarily make him the greatest pope in in, in history i'm not saying that but it makes him someone you think well this person is a Christian. This person is a disciple. This person is serious. Now, the other th thing that shone out at that meeting uh, was, was his love for the church and his sense of people. I mean, he's famous for this. And as a young man, he said he wanted to join the Jesuits. He said this when he was a teenager, because I'm not going to be a priest in a basilica. I'm going to be a Jesuit because I'm going to want to go out to the neighborhoods, uh, to the shanty towns, to be with people. And this is his other passion. After Jesus, his passion is people and especially the poor. He's a constant advocate and defender of los descartos, as they say, those who are thrown aside. The marginal, the vulnerable, migrants, prisoners, the elderly, the unborn. And he verifies his, his words by actions. You know, he'll go off to the island of Lesbos to meet, to meet migrants. He'll, he'll respond warmly to the Rohingya. He'll have people brought to the Vatican and, and put them up. Now, he can be, it's like an old-fashioned Jesuit in many ways, he can be singeing about sin especially what he calls corruption, when sin is kind of embedded in a person or a setup, And he's actually the fiercest of the recent popes. But as a pastor, uh, he loves just to reach out, uh, to get the smell of the sheep in the famous phrase. And he feels any failure on his part, of course, you know, everybody fails, but he feels any failure to do that very acutely. Um, now, there's, there's, a, there's a good story here. Uh, in, in his childhood, in, in the family home, there was a, a woman of Italian origin, this was Buenos Aires, uh, a working woman who came in twice a week to help his mother. And Bergoglio would have known her when he was, when he was a, a, a boy. Well, you know, he grew up and went uh, on his way and they lost touch. Now, years later, when he was a busy Jesuit in a big institution, 
uh, he, he got a message, it was at a meeting, that she was at the door to see him. Well, he was so preoccupied that he sent her a note asking her to come back the next day. Now, she didn't. And a few weeks later, this suddenly came back to him and a strong sense of guilt came over him. Uh, and he began to, he thought, I must pray uh, for this woman. Now, this episode stuck with him, in fact, for 25 years. It, it couldn't find out where she was. It couldn't get any news of her. And then he did hear. And the re reason she hadn't come back the following morning was that the next day she was going back to Italy. So she had come to say goodbye uh, to this busy man whom she had once known as a boy. Well, things did work out for her in Italy and later she returned to Argentina. And then, kind of by, by a series of little coincidences, he heard about this, he, he, he tracked her down and they were able to meet up again. He was a cardinal by this time. And this is, this is a striking thing that he said, it was the happiest day of my life, meeting this woman again. A good question to ask what's been the happiest day of your life, was to see this now old lady, after all those years, that old lady whom he'd said, sorry, I'm too busy to see you, and felt wretched about uh, for a long time. Now, she was indeed by then an old lady. Uh, she wore um, a holy medal round her neck, and... Uh, she gave it to him, and he still wears it. So, it's a touching story. Well, here's the other end of the scale. Um, in an interview, 2016, Pope Benedict XVI, of course, who's now living in the grounds of the Vatican, spoke very warmly of just how personally kind Francis is to him. Uh, he has said, this is Pope Emeritus Benedict, he has given me the gift of a marvellous fatherly, brotherly relationship. Often little gifts arrive up here, letters that were written personally. Before setting out on long journeys, the Pope never fails to pay me a visit. The human kindness with which he treats me is for me a special grace of this final phase of my life for which I can only be grateful. Words alone are not proof of availability to others. He puts it into practice with me. And uh, a little while later, one of his priestly jubilees, and Francis came along to, to, um, to, 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 to have a little party, and as it were, to greet him, and uh, congratulated Benedict, and then and Benedict sent a really lovely thing to him. Uh, he said, Holy Father, my true home is your goodness. There I feel safe. Well, I don't mention this so we all bring out our handkerchiefs, uh, but passion for Christ, you know, and passion for people, and especially that, you know, there's a frail old man uh, just round the corner from him and he doesn't forget him. Doesn't mean, doesn't turn Francis necessarily into a wonderful Pope, but I'm just trying to help us learn him and glimpse what makes him tick, because this is key to him being the Pope that he is. It's what forms his vision of the church, talks about a mother with an open heart, talks about a field hospital where those wounded by life can find succour. Uh, this helps us understand what gets up his nose about a self-congratulating, self-preoccupied church, what gives him, as I say, his sensitivity to migrants or the victims of natural disasters, the people whose lives are run over by the money-making juggernauts, by the effect on the poor of ecological devastation. He's not someone, and this is key, He's not someone driven by some isms. He hasn't, you know, he's read plenty of books, no doubt. But uh, he, he, he's, not, he's not following out 
some ideology, a socio-political interpretation of Pope Francis. You get them sometimes, won't do, breaks down, misses the point. He lives from other sources. So I'll pause here, um, end of part one. But I just wanted to point to that this is, this is, you know, so far as we can say this of any human being, this is, this is the heart of the man. This is what makes him tick. This is, this is out of what he acts. Thank you.